Please take your Bible and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 You shall not add to the word which I command you nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of Yahuwah your God which I command you He says we are not to add to the word of Yahuwah nor take anything from it Some people try to add to it through the centuries Jewish sages and rabbis have thought they had the authority to add rules and regulations that govern every little thing that people do from the time they get up to the time they go to bed. These added rules and ordinance, ordinances are known as the, the tradition of the elders. It's also called the oral Torah or oral law. Orthodox Jews, the strictest followers of Judaism, believe that Moses did not write down everything that Yahuwah spoke to him at Mount Sinai. They believe that additional revelation from God was passed down orally from one generation to the next, and that this other teaching revealed how the Israelites were supposed to apply and obey the commandments in the written Torah. The idea is that additional details were needed so we could know more precisely how to obey the teachings of the written Torah. This other revelation, this collection of explanations that were passed down orally for centuries and finally written down is what's called the oral Torah or oral law and it's also known as the tradition of the elders, Messiah, rebuked the scribes and Pharisees for keeping those rules while neglecting the commandments of God. To the Orthodox Jews, the oral Torah carries just as much weight and authority as the written Torah, if not more. As a result, most devout Jews today, especially the rabbis, read and study and teach the oral Torah more than the written Torah. It may contain some useful historical information, but we are not to put it on the same level of authority for our lives as we do the written Torah. Pastor Jim rarely consults it because so much of it contradicts or adds to God's Word. It even contradicts itself quite often. It is not to be trusted. Amen. And the Bible contains a statement that clearly and firmly supports our position and presents quite a challenge for the authority of the rabbis. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 4, And Moses wrote all the words of Yahuwah. Yeah. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the front of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. According to Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the words of Scripture make us complete and thoroughly equipped. We don't need the oral law. Amen. The Pharisees and the rabbis have done exactly what Moses said not to do. We need to stick with what the written word says. It's the only trustworthy authority for our lives. And on the other hand, there are a lot of people today who try to take away from the Word. Not that they literally try to remove parts of the Bible, but most Christians have been led to believe that we can just disregard what the God of Israel and the, the prophets said in the so-called Old Testament because it has supposedly been replaced by the New Testament, making two-thirds of the Bible irrelevant to our lives. And that is, very, that is a very serious mistake. Amen. 
The Bible says Yahuwah's words and his covenants and commandments and laws are everlasting for all generations. In verses 5 and 6, Moses continues to explain some things to this new regeneration of Israelites in the wilderness. The younger ones who are finally about to enter into the promised land. In these words, he teaches them and us that the Torah is given to us a both law and revelation. It is revelation because when we live our lives according to Yahuwah's instructions contained in the Torah, we are living out a revelation of his righteousness to the world. If we, re if we are really obedient and living by God's commandments, other people should be able to see that we are different and that our lives demonstrate godliness. We are revealing true righteousness to them. Deuteronomy chapter or Deuteronomy four makes it clear that when Israel, and by Israel I mean the Israel of God, the entire body of believers in Messiah, when Israel repents of disobedience and lives out the Torah, the world will be able to see Yahuwah and his disciples and his righteousness in our lives. By keeping the commandments of Torah, his people are to be a testimony to all nations. Moses says in verse 5 that our observing the commandments is wisdom and understanding in their sight. They should see our obedience and our observance of all that God has commanded, and they should recognize that no nation has statutes and judgments as righteous as those of the Torah. When our lives are characterized by the wisdom and holiness of godly living, people should see us with respect. It should be a very attractive thing for people to see that our obedience results in blessings and rewards. They should be curious about our lifestyle and how it all works. And they should be attracted to the blessings and rewards Yahuwah gives us. So attracted that they will come to him in faith and repentance so they can share in his love and his blessings and his rewards. Even people who still think that Torah and grace don't work together sometimes have to admit that they admire people of Torah. Genuine godliness can and should be very attractive to people. It's a shame and it can be frustrating that it's not always. Living a life of conspicuous obedience to Yahuwah's commandments is actually the Torah's method of evangelism. Did you ever notice that the apostles never once had their communities conduct evangelistic crusades? or try to coordinate outreach events? Right. On Not one time. <laughs> Instead of that, Paul says in Colossians 4, verse 5, chapter 4, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside redeeming the time. In other words, letting people who aren't in the body see us conducting ourselves according to the wisdom of Torah, is making the most of every opportunity and using our time wisely. That's what he means here by the phrase redeeming the time. And Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Amen. Where do you suppose Peter got this idea? He learned it from Yahushua. Bless you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. <laughs> Let your light 
so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And Yahushua's words also seem to echo the prophet Isaiah who said in chapter 60 verse 3, The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. This form of evangelism has been used in Judaism for most of the last 2,000 years. It has been said that Jews don't aggressively try to convert people to their faith in the same way Christian evangelists do. Instead, they go about their business, minding their affairs, and obeying God's commandments. Yet, there is a steady stream of proselytizing in, in Judaism. Went over that this morning. Sometimes it seems that more Christians become Jews than Jews become Christian. Despite the fact that Christianity spends a lot of money, time, and energy on Jewish outreach. In Christianity, a similar form of evangelism is called lifestyle evangelism. According to Wikipedia, lifestyle evangelism is an approach to evangelism characterized by someone demonstrating their faith by their actions in the hope that people around them will be impressed with how God affects that person's life and become a Christian. To some people, this means primarily observing the golden rule. Always being nice to people, always being honest, and living a moral life of genuine integrity. But in our culture, there are a lot of people who do this without any spiritual or religious motivation. And this lifestyle approach does not always lead observers to question how God and the Bible are involved in their lives. I think that this lifestyle approach is more biblical and it should be much more effective when it includes visible obedience of God's commandments. It seems that most believers in the Hebrew roots and Messianic congregations begin to change the, from traditional Christianity because of an experience with someone else who was observing and keeping the commandments, such as joining them for Passover Seder or worshiping on the biblical Sabbath instead of Sunday. It feels good to come a step closer to God by joining others in obeying Him. Being a light to the nations is Yahuwah's ideal for his people. Being seen obeying his commandments should draw people into a closer experience with him. When people ask you about your faith, it can be hard for us to give a good short explanation, but you might try saying something like this. We take our faith to a deeper level by trying to do what John, Paul, James, and even Messiah himself all say in the Bible that believers should do, which is to obey the commandments of God. Obedience leads us into a more meaningful experience with our God and His Son and His Holy Spirit. And the Bible promises us blessings and rewards for our obedience. Ultimately, the goal is that all nations would learn the ways of Yahuwah. In the Torah, the prophet Isaiah says this about the Messianic era after Yahushua returns in Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahuwah from Jerusalem. Paul says that our observance of Torah will even hush up our enemies. In Titus chapter 2 verses 7 and 8, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned that one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you 
When Paul says things like that, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, we need to remember that good works refers not only to good deeds, but also to obedience to God's commandments. We have enough opposition in the world as it is between those who don't want to submit to God at all and those who have been misled into believing that Christian, Christians don't need to bother with obeying his commandments. In spite of what the Bible says, we don't need to give our opponents any more ammunition to use against us. So let's live lives of honesty, integrity, incorruptibility, reverence for our Creator, and obedience to His instructions. When people ask a question like, why can't you come to my get-together on Saturday? Or, why don't you eat pork? <laughs> it gives us an opportunity to explain using names they know that we simply try to do what God, Jesus, and the apostles all say in the Bible that God's people should do. They may or might not understand or even care, but it will establish some credibility for us as people of Yahuwah and people of the book. Then whenever they do have questions about Yahuwah or the Bible, they just might come to us for the answers. And when they allow us to minister to them, we can offer them the wisdom of Yahuwah that is found in His Word. Alright, back to Deuteronomy 4. In verses 9 through 10, Moses instructs us to teach Yahuwah's words in the Torah to our children and grandchildren. We are to train our children in the ways of our God. Paul repeats this idea in his letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians, oh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training of admonition of the Lord. If we fail to teach our kids and grandkids the, the truth of God of Messiah and of Torah the next generation may never understand how important it is Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 that is our responsibility to teach the words of Torah to our children and to do it diligently in the New Testament times memorizing scripture was a primary mode of education even before Messiah's day. Public education of children in Israel began with instruction in Torah. How ironic that public education has now become so godless in Western countries like the USA. It's no wonder that more and more people who take their faith seriously are pulling their kids out of public schools and educating them in private religious schools or in home schools. Amen. In verse 11, Moses reminds them of what happened at Mount Sinai. Some of them were old enough at that time to remember it. They saw the fire and heard the voice of Yahuwah speaking directly to all the people who were there. They had a genuine first-hand experience with the God of Israel, but they saw no form. He did not reveal his image to them. Moses goes on in the following verses to explain that since they saw no form, trying to associate Yahuwah with any carved image would be a corrupt thing to do. Idolatry is one of the things that he hates most. And we should realize that it's not just idols that represent other gods that he forbids. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 15 through 18. Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when Yahuwah spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. 
lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, or likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. Moses warns them and us, to not carve an image of anything to represent Yahuwah and to not use any carved image in their worship of him. Some people take this a, a step farther. They think he means that all forms of sculpture and art are prohibited if the subject is a living creature. Does he mean that? Let's go back to Yahuwah's first commandment about carved images. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 and 4, Yahuwah prohibits having other gods before him and making a carved or graven image of anything in heaven above or on the earth, below or in the water. That seems to include sculpture, but does it? Some people stop after reading verse 4 and they understand this passage to forbid any form of sculpture or artistic carvings, even paintings. But to me, this is inconsistent with Yahuwah's instructions in Bible passages like these. Moses creating a bronze serpent. Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. The labor huge bronze basin in the temple was upheld by a dozen brass oxen. 1 Kings chapter 7 verse 25. The veil in the temple had a depiction of cherubim. Exodus chapter 26 verse 31. The cover of the Ark of the Covenant had two cherubim. Exodus chapter 25 verses 18 through 22. The stones on the high priest garments were engraved in Exodus chapter 28 verses 9 through 11. Panels in the temple were engraved with lions, cherubim, and palm trees in 1 Kings chapter 7 verse 36. I think the key to understanding this correctly is to look at the next verse of Exodus 20. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. In verse 5 he says to not bow down to them or serve these images. It's the worship of these images or idols that is forbidden. It's idolatry that is condemned, not all art. There is nothing inherently sinful in art or sculptures or he wouldn't have wanted them in the temple. It's okay if you don't want to have any sculptures or art in your home if you think that's what God is concerned about. But I really don't think that's what he means. Clearly, it is worshiping any creatures or objects that represent any God that is forbidden. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 19, Moses goes on to prohibit worship of the sun, moon, and stars. For thousands of years, people have worshipped the sky and the stars and especially the sun as if they were gods. Our names for the days of the week, except for the Sabbath, all came from the names of false gods. The first day of the week was named after the sun god and that's why it's called Sunday. Pagans who worshiped the sun were accustomed to honoring their sun god on Sunday. And after Roman Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, he passed laws in 321 AD 
They closed the courts and restricted labor on Sundays, which pushed people into making Sunday their day of worship. Plus, since they were used to honoring their God on Sunday, these laws made it easier for them to make this change of religion if they didn't have to start worshiping on the biblical Sabbath instead of Sunday. Around 325 AD, Constantine made worship on any day except Sunday illegal. In 363 AD, Christians were forbidden by the council of Laodicea to even rest on the true Sabbath. But these changes were never sanctioned by Yahuwah or Messiah or any of the apostles. Amen. You won't find one word in the Bible about the day we worship God being changed from the Sabbath to Sunday. That's why there are millions of Sabbath keepers in the world today who choose to remember the Sabbath as Yahuwah said to. The Bible says the commandments of God are permanent, eternal, and everlasting, and that they are for all His people. So Moses warned them not to worship the sun, moon, and stars because that's a form of idolatry which is strictly forbidden. In verses 25 and 27, Moses tells them that committing idolatry will get them exiled from the land. And that's exactly what happened centuries later. But in verse 29, he tells them that even while God's people are in the darkness of exile, it won't be so dark and so thick that we can't find him. We can always connect with Yahuwah if we repent and seek Him with all our heart and with all our soul. Israel had come to know Yahuwah and had come in a relationship with Him as a nation partly because of two events they had experienced. The exodus from Egypt and giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. Moses told them to ask whether anything like that had ever happened or even if they had heard of anything like that. These two experiences demonstrated the supremacy of Yahuwah and his miracle working power. Israel was saved by the exodus and sanctified, which means set apart or made holy, by their agreement and their commitment to obey the Torah. No other God had ever done anything like this for anyone. No other God had even promised anything like this. We need to remember that salvation and sanctification are like two sides of the same coin. Salvation must take place before sanctification. Just as the ancient Israelites were saved from slavery in Egypt before they received the Torah at Mount Sinai, being saved comes before learning to walk in the fullness of our salvation by obeying Yahuwah's commandments. Amen. But both steps are essential if we are to have the best and deepest relationship with Him. Amen. To Moses, Yahuwah's rescue of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and His revelation at Mount Sinai were the foundation of their faith and a demonstration of the sovereignty of the God of Israel. He had demonstrated his superiority over all the other gods of Egypt using the people of Israel to establish his name in the world. Beginning in verse 41, Moses designated three cities as cities of refuge, cities where a person who had caused the death of another person could go and wait in safety until his trial, if it was an accident. He would be declared innocent, but if it turned out to be murder, he would be executed. The original instructions for the cities of refuge back in Numbers 35 say that the Israelites were to appoint these cities of refuge 
after they crossed over the Jordan and went into the promised land. But here in Deuteronomy 4, Moses goes ahead and does it before they cross over. Did Moses jump the gun? Should he have waited? The traditional interpretation is that since he knew he wouldn't be going across the Jordan with the Israelites, he went ahead and established the cities of refuge so that he could participate in the mitzvah, the, the command. Whether that interpretation is true or not, it does not illustrate a principle that can help us with our obedience of Yahuwah's commandments. Sorry, it does illustrate a principle that can help us with our obedience of Yahuwah's commandments. Sorry about that. We live in an imperfect world and many of his commandments cannot, cannot be obeyed completely. So many of them require being in the land and a temple and the Aaronic priesthood. And they simply can't be fully obeyed at this time. And idealist might become discouraged and say, well, since we can't obey this or that commandment completely, why should we bother trying to obey it at all? I know people like that. But if we apply Moses' actions to this question, we might see that even a little bit is better than none. We do the same thing with our Passover Seder, don't we? Amen. We can't offer a Passover lamb as a sacrifice because we're not in Jerusalem. And the animal sacrifices for the feast can't be offered because we don't have a temple or a priesthood. Amen. But we don't let that stop us from having a Seder meal or commemorating Yahuwah. Uh, Yahuwah is passing over the Israelites' homes in Egypt. And it doesn't have to prevent us from observing the Feast of Unleavened Bread as much as we can to commemorate the Exodus. We can't offer sacrifices at Shavuot or at Sukkot either, but we can still assemble at those times to observe those biblical holy times the best we can and remember what Yahuwah has done for us. Before Moses begins to repeat the commandments of the Torah, he reminds them the commandments are part of the covenant that Yahuwah made with them at Mount Sinai. He says in chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, Yahuwah our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. Yahuwah did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us. To those who are here today, all of us who are alive, Yahuwah talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. The wording of verse 3, that Yahuwah did not make the covenant with our fathers, but with us, is confusing to our Western thinking minds. But in Hebraic thought patterns, this simply emphasizes the present generation's participation and responsibility in the covenant. We have already covered many of these commandments when they were first given, so we won't repeat the teaching today. Let's go to verse 4 of chapter 6. This passage begins what is called the, the Shema, and it's one of the most well-known passages of the entire Bible. In chapter 6, verses 4 through 5, Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our God, Yahuwah is one. You shall love your Hua, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Messiah says these words are the greatest and most important commandment of all. To understand the first part correctly, we need to know that in the Hebraic way of thinking and speaking, to hear someone means to obey them. The word here in Hebrew is the word Shema. It means more than just physically hearing an audible sound. It's a Hebrew idiom that means to listen and obey. Got loud on that one. 
Yahuwah doesn't want us to hear his teaching in the Torah. He wants us to follow through and obey it. James chapter 1 verse 22 says to us, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. In Romans chapter 2 verse 13 says, It's the doers of the law, the Torah, that will be declared righteous. The complete Shema is the central liter liturgy. Thank you. There you go, liturgical. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't get that out. Component of worship and the basic confession of faith <laughs> that Yahuwah, our God, is one and we are told to obey. Pretty simple, isn't it? Instead of a long doctrinal st statement or complicated theology, we have a s simple call to faith and obedience. And that's how it should be. What we believe affects how we behave. Ooh. Amen. If it doesn't, it's not genuine faith. It's so common for preachers and teachers to put so much emphasis on believing something and on certain confessions, but little mention is made of obedience. Evangelism has been reduced to just getting people to say they believe in certain things, haven't we all heard? Do you believe that Jesus died for you? Do you accept him as your savior? And if they say yes, then the mention is accomplished and the evangelist goes on to someone else. He stops after just beginning the process. But if we think about it from a Hebraic Torah perspective, the questions would change a little too. Do you believe that Yahushua would die for you? Then what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Yahushua himself said several times in various ways that we should obey God's commandments. Are you going to truly follow him and do what he said and repent and start obeying the commandments? After all, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, that obeying the commandments is how we show God we love Him. That's how to love Him and the way He wants to be loved, according to His Word. This Torah person portion teaches us that our experience of Yahuwah's promises depends on our clinging to Him fearing him in reverence, teaching our children his ways, and seeking him and loving him with all our heart, soul, and strength. That's the biggest part of what the true faith and love are. That's what Yahuwah wants from us. We should seek him with wholehearted devotion and passion. Hear his words. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 29, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Amen. If we will fear him and obey his commandments, he says it will be well with us and our children. The Bible promises us more health, longer life, more prosperity, more peace and more answers to prayers if we are obedient to his commandments. Amen. Who doesn't want those things? Let's obey him.